service as a career uh, 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 as a city councilor in Liverpool City Council from 1972 to 1980. He was elected uh, a member of parliament for Liverpool Edge Hill 1979 to 83. He was the youngest member of parliament at the time. Uh, and for Liverpool Mosley Hill 1983 to 1997. Uh, he was uh, raised to the peerage as an independent life peer in 1997. Uh, the Lord is a regular contributor to the BBC top uh, 10 peers. He is a strong advocate of human rights, including freedom of religion, belief, and minority rights, human trafficking, refugees, and ethical issues. Uh, he has published 12 books, uh, most recent book, Building Bridges, uh, What's for North Korea. Uh, the Honorable Lord uh, was awarded uh, Pope Benedict XVI, uh, Knight Commander of St. Gregory, uh, for human rights and charitable work. He is a patron, trustee, and associate member of a number of voluntary organizations and charities, uh, and probably uh, a title not too many of you guys may know, he is the chairman of Coptic Solidarity's board, uh, advisory board. Uh, for 20 years, uh, 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 Lord Alton was professor of citizenship at Liverpool uh, uh, John Moore University. He is a visiting professor at Yibanyan University of Sciences and Technology in China, and he is a visiting fellow at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, the Honorable, the Right Honorable Lord Alton. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, thank you very much for the warmth of that welcome. And it's always a great pleasure to be with you here today, but also to be sharing the platform with my friends and colleagues, some of whom I've worked with over very many years on these important issues. I was struck this morning by some of what was being said about the danger of silence. And all of us especially those who enjoy the kind of privileges and freedoms that we enjoy in our Western democracies, have to use these privileges, these opportunities to speak and to act at every opportunity. I was thinking of uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was that remarkable Protestant theologian who stood against the Nazis, who refused to compromise, and who did speak out. And it was Bonhoeffer who said not to speak, is to speak, not to act, is to act. And I regard that as a, a challenge to us, an inspiration as well, that we must speak and we must act using all the privileges that we have been given. I was also struck by the reference that was made to the Armenians this morning, and to that famous phrase of Hitler's, that who now remembers the Armenians? A few months ago, I read a remarkable novel by Franz Werfel, but it was based on fact. It was, a, it's called 40 Days on Muzadag. It was written in the 1920s. Hitler had the books burnt because he didn't want that collective memory to be recalled of what had happened to the Armenians. And in the case of this group who was celebrated in that novel, which to this day the Turkish government tries to suppress because they stood against what was being done to them and their community. So not to speak is to speak, not to act is to act. We have to hand on that collective memory. It was here in the American Congress at the end of the Second World War that another Protestant, it was Pastor Martin Niemoller, who came and gave evidence to the Congressional Committee. And they said, how is it that in a country, Germany, where there had been so many nominal Christians from the Catholic and Protestant tradition. How is it that Nazism, Holocaust, and all those things could have come about? Of course, he famously said, first they came for the Jews, and because I was not a Jew, I did nothing. And then he went through the different groups, and he said, and then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. That is what happens when you fail to speak out. That is what happens when you fail to act. And I sometimes have to remind myself, thinking of the Armenians, first they did come for the Armenians, and the world did nothing. Then they came for the Greek Orthodox, and for the Chaldean Catholics, and the Syrian Orthodox. And in our own times, they've come for the Syrian and Iraqi Christians. 
Boko Haram have come to the Nigerian Christians. The uh, Taliban have come to the Pakistan Christians. You think about the depredations of the Sudanese government against the Sudanese Christians, an indicted genocide criminal, Phil Bashar al-Bashir, still leading the government of Sudan with impunity, despite all the things that were done. Think about the Christians driven out of the Nineveh plains in Iraq. Think about the Syrian Christians. Then they came for me. If we do not speak out, if we don't act in solidarity, if we don't use the privileges and freedoms that we have been given, then who will be left to speak for us? Because in due course, the very thing, this double-headed attack on Judeo-Christian values, coming from, on one hand, radical Islam, and on the other, sort of angry atheism, they will come for all the things that we believe in and cherish if we are indifferent. So there is a challenge that I think is cap captured by this conference, the challenge urging us to be engaged and involved. And on the credit side of the sheet, I think only in this last year of the appointment of a man like Senator Brownback, an old friend of mine, uh, with whom I spent a, a long weekend of, just before his appointment as uh, the Special Envoy, Special Representative on Freedom of Religion or Belief uh, in his home state of Kansas. And we talked about the things challenging us today and what better appointment could have been made so that working with people like Knox, whom you'll hear from in due course, a man like Senator Brownback, a really good appointment, uh, speaking up for those beleaguered Christian communities I have just referred to. And in my own country, in England, my good friend, Bishop Angelos, is now Archbishop Angelos. He is the Archbishop of London. And what a thing that is for us to celebrate, that this has happened in this last year. But let me tell you this. Having prevailed on our National Christians in Parliament Committee to invite Archbishop Angelos to be the guest speaker at our National Prayer Breakfast a couple of years ago, a few months later he was with me in Parliament. And we were having tea, and a policeman came rushing into the tea room and said, Sir, you have to leave immediately. What had happened was there was an ISIS attack on our parliament. And Angelos and I ended up standing in Westminster Hall with hundreds of other people, yards away from where one of our brave policemen, P.C. Palmer, had been murdered by an ISIS operative who had penetrated the parliamentary estate. Well, they will come for us. They will come for you. They'll come for me if we fail to act. As Dr. George says, the first time I attended your conference, I was the guest of another Dr. Gurgis, uh, Dr. Helmi Gurgis, the founder of the UK COPS. And in 2015, at a memorial service at the Royal Society of Medicine, I was privy privileged to give the tribute to Helmi. And I wouldn't want, want today to begin without honoring the memory of a great man and good friend. He'd want me to begin these remarks about the nature of religious persecution by reminding you how quickly discrimination can morph into persecution and how uncontained persecution can morph into crimes against humanity and genocide. Just as night follows day, when we do turn a blind eye, when we do fail to speak out, the one can inexorably lead to the other. While a member of the House of Commons, I've been one of the founders of Jubilee Campaign, a charity which, among other things, campaigns for freedom of religion and belief rights conferred under Article 18, spelled out here on the slide of the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Jubilee had been founded in response to the murder, incarceration, and egregious violations of human rights of countless men and women in the former Soviet Union. But after the Berlin Wall fell, Jubilee wanted to refocus its work, and in the 1990s asked me to travel to Egypt and to publish a report into the discrimination experienced by Egypt's Copts. That visit opened my eyes to the suffering and persecution of the Copts and to the wonderful story of this ancient apostolic church rooted in the earliest accounts of Christianity. I was privileged to visit St. Mark's Cathedral in Cairo and to meet the late Pope Shenouda and indeed to host his visit to London. In the report that I subsequently published, I highlighted the rank discrimination experienced by the Coptic community and the world's complete indifference. That indifference and a failure by the world community to take religious persecution seriously 
led to an appalling escalation, and in 2013, to an orgy of violence, which I described, and Dr. George referred to it this morning in his opening remarks, as reminiscent of Europe's crystal nut. Look at the synagogue and look at the church in these pictures. Coptic churches, homes and businesses desecrated and attacked. Well, in November 1938, on Kristallnacht, the sledgehammers and petrol had left more than a thousand synagogues burned and over 7,000 Jewish shops and businesses in ruins. The streets were covered in shards of smashed glass from broken windows. Compare the charred husk of Fassenstrasse <coughs> Synagogue in Berlin in 1938 with this picture taken in August 2013 of the black and walls of Degler's Ruin Church of the Virgin Mary. And you'll readily see why this comparison is accurate and apt. Compare these quotations. In 1938, the British Times newspaper said that no foreign propagandist bent upon blackening Germany before the world could outdo the tale of burnings and beatings, of blackguardly assaults on defenseless and innocent people which disgraced that country yesterday. And then, in 2013, in an almost identical vein, the Times reported how, and I quote, dozens of churches, homes, and businesses have been set alight and looted in Egypt forcing millions of Christians into hiding amidst the worst bout of sectarian violence in the country's modern history. Some Coptic Christian communities are being made to pay bribes as local Islamists exploit the turmoil by seeking to revive a 7th century tax called Jizya levied on non-Muslims. The Sunday Times newspaper said this, how in one village, first they daubed the Christian shops and homes with a red cross then the mob stormed the police station before turning its wrath on the church. The tax on the cops in number, as we know, about 10% of the 85 million Egyptian population <coughs> occurred throughout the country, and the attacks occurred in a climate of impunity, with the perpetrators terrorizing at leisure. As in 1938, where was the world? Where was the world in speaking out against the terrorization and persecution of a religious minority? One of my great heroes is this man, the former British chief rabbi, Jonathan Lord Sachs. Always mindful of the events which led to Crystal Night, he described the assault on the cops, these were his words, as a tragedy going almost unremarked, and is, he said, the religious equivalent of ethnic cleansing. Of course, this virus of hatred is no respecter of boundaries, and this was graphically illustrated in 2015 in Libya where 21 men, 20 from Egypt, one from Ghana, were murdered by ISIS. And finally, of course, in May of this year, after a three-year wait and a number of broken promises, the Egyptian Coptic families of those beheaded have finally received their loved ones' remains. His Holiness, Pope Tardros, accompanied by several bishops, priests and deacons, welcomed the 20 coffins at Cairo Airport, from where the coffins were transported to the village of Al-Ur in Minya province and to the Church of the Martyrs of the Faith and Homeland. Epstein Roshi Lame, the widow of another of the victims, Samuel Armin Wilson, said this, I'm very proud of my husband Samuel because he was martyred in the name of Jesus Christ and he didn't renounce his faith. He honored me, his sons, and Christianity. Yet, friends, despite the welcome intervention of President al-Sisi in bringing home the bodies of these martyrs, discrimination and persecution continue. On April the 9th, 2017, on Palm Sunday, the start of Holy Week, two Egyptian Coptic churches became a target for terrorists. At least 27 people were killed in the explosion at St. George's Coptic Church in Tanta, and 17 people lost their lives in St. Mark's Coptic Church in Alexandria. Over 100 people were injured in both attacks. A few hours after the attacks, Daesh claimed responsibility for unleashed terror. The attacks in Egypt add to the legacy of international terror with which we become so familiar in Syria and Iraq. It also adds to the legacy of a terrorist attack specifically targeting Christian communities worldwide, and to which I'll return in a moment. Last month in Egypt, there was a new report of yet more young Christian women being abducted. At least seven Coptic Christian women and girls disappeared in Egypt last month alone in what's becoming a recurring phenomenon and which was alluded to during our discussions this morning. 
The stories of Christine Lally, these are the pictures, 26-year-old Maverick two, 17-year-old Briscoe Mere, a second-year student, 16-year-old Hoda Atef Gali Gilgis, Mary Adley Miller, 40, and Maverick three from Minya Governorate, who disappeared on the 5th of April, bring shame for those who abducted them and a tragedy into the lives of every woman and their families affected. In each case, the family of the woman says she was abducted by a Muslim who wished to convert her to Islam and marry her. All the disappearances have been reported to the police. However, their families allege that they have often been met with inaction or indifference. Some have even claimed that members of the police force were involved in the disappearances. Where here, friends, is the voice of international indignation? There can be no peace or stability in Egypt or in any of the other countries in the region if the authorities fail to uphold the rule of law, fail to intervene in preventing attacks, fail to bring perpetrators to justice, or by ignoring the violent rhetoric which whips up hatred. In a climate of fear, intimidation, coupled with historic and long-standing discrimination, it's little wonder that people try to flee. But be clear, not only is this a humanitarian outrage, if such ethnic and religious cleansing succeeded, and a country without diversity, without tolerance of differences created, it will be a wretched place for people to live. Not just for the numerical minority, all the evidence shows that countries that make a virtue of religious freedom are the most prosperous, the most stable, and the most advanced of societies. All this has been happening while Western governments and international bodies have a blind spot about religious persecution. This makes a mockery of the claims to prioritize human rights. Their human rights agendas are partial and they are selective. The United Nations cannot strengthen, promote and protect human rights if it doesn't prioritize religious freedom. In a new report on anti-conversion laws and the international response, Alliance Defending Freedom says, I quote, that some UN entities, especially special rapporteurs, have highlighted the problems with anti-conversion laws, but other UN entities have failed to condemn them. This, they say, is emblematic of the UN's overall failure to protect religious freedom. The, this can give license to extremists to persecute minority and religious uh, minority groups. Reports, some of them are here on the screen, from eight of the church in need, open doors, Christian Solidarity Worldwide, and the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom have been portraying the dire situation of religious groups worldwide, providing examples of the persecution suffered and explaining its impact. Their reports are filled with instances of abuse, humiliation, violence perpetrated against religious groups because of them expressing their religious belief, manifesting their religious belief in public, or merely belonging to or identifying themselves with a religious group. In January, Open Doors released its watch list for 2018, an annual ranking of 50 countries where it's the most difficult, if not impossible, to live as Christians. Open Doors assessed that in 11 countries this persecution was extreme and in 24 very high. The Oxford Dictionary defines persecution as hostility and ill treatment, especially because of race or political or religious beliefs, oppression. However, persecution is not uh, universally understood. It has several, several definitions, including a legal definition under the Rome Statute. According to Article 72G of the Roman Statute, persecution means the intentional and severe deprivation of fundamental rights contrary to international law by reason of the identity of the group or collectively. As such, persecution is a crime against humanity under Article 718 of the Roman Statute. The crime of persecution is a form of discrimination based on political, racial, national, ethnic, cultural, religious, or gendered grounds. However, the crime of persecution is even more severe. The crime can eventually lead, as we know, and as I said at the outset, eventually to genocide, if all other elements of genocide are established. It's been argued that extreme persecution can amount to genocide, if the persecution is intended to achieve the destruction of a group in whole or in part. I haven't time now to read you this, but it's the trial chamber uh, conclusion in prosecutor versus Kupreshik, and I think that the notes of what I'm saying are going to be made available to you afterwards if you want to read it in full. The argument, though, has also been used 
by the genocide scholar Gregory Stanton, and again, I've quoted him in my remarks, and you'll be able to read them. In any event, it must be emphasized that many of the reports on persecution, for example, perpetrated against religious groups, do not refer to the Rome Statute definition of persecution, but they use the word persecution to describe a wide range of treatment suffered by both groups, from discrimination to physical violence. Christians, friends, are the most persecuted religious group in the world. And this research by the Pew Research Group Center on Religion and Public Life revealed that Christians were harassed in 130 countries between mid-2006 and mid-2009. In 104 countries, the harassment was conducted by governments and organizations, and in 100 countries, by social groups and individuals. These are examples from around the world. They're all in my remarks if you want to read them afterwards. But look at these photographs from places like Pakistan and the Philippines. This is a photograph I took when I visited a detention center in Southeast Asia where Ahmadis, who are not allowed to describe themselves as Muslims, there are five million of them in Pakistan and they're denied a right to vote, but Christians are caged like wild animals. Uh, I could tell you some of the appalling things that happened to Pakistan Christians. Here are some pictures that remind us about the plight of Asiya Bibi, whom we heard about this morning, who is on death row. But remember Shabazz Bhatti, who was murdered, along with Salman Tasir, who was the Muslim governor of the Punjab. I met his son only on Monday last, where I was taking evidence from a group on behalf of the parliamentary group on the Ahmadis. And his son, who had been abducted himself, by the Taliban, spent five years in detention where they did utterly wretched and wicked things to him. His own dignity and his own heroism today in courageously highlighting what is happening to Christians, though he comes from a Muslim background, well, he, is, he has his father's DNA. Let's hope he doesn't have his father's and Shabazz Bhatti's faith. Or if you think about the response all around the world, our failure to speak out, our failure to do anything significant. Let me cut my remarks short because I know others have got to speak. We're fast approaching the fourth anniversary of the attack on the Yazidis who were sheltering on Sinjar. And on that occasion, the first government to be in touch with me about that, to say, what are we doing about it, was a Hungarian government. And bless them, despite the criticisms that George Soros and others lay at their door for their heroism and their determination to prioritize the plight of Christians in and Yazidis uh, in, in northern Iraq and Syria. It was the day on which the fate and future of the Yazidi community changed forever, together with the fate of other religious minorities in the region. Perhaps, friends, August the 3rd, the day that they were on that mountain, could be used to highlight our responsibilities to victims and survivors of such mass atrocities. The some survivors should play some part in the decision-making about how U.S. and other aid should be used uh, to help rebuild their communities. The memory of the victims should motivate us to achieve more clarity in the approach taken, and religious persecution should never be tolerated again, independently of levels of persecution, independently from the act of conducting the atrocities wherever and whenever it occurs. One thing is for sure, the international community can and do much more than it has in the past. So why can we have a World Poetry Day, but not a day to speak out about all those who have suffered this plight? Maybe that's an objective we should go away from this conference, determined to bring about a day around the world. As we have Red Wednesday now in the UK, where we light up public buildings, the Coptic Cathedral, along with Westminster Abbey, Westminster Cathedral, and the Houses of Parliament were lit on Red Wednesday last November to commemorate the plight of Christians around the world and others suffering for their religious belief. Let's have a UN sponsored day, and if they would do it, let's do it <coughs> ourselves. With an ever-growing level of religious persecution worldwide, the issue requires a systematic, structured approach. It requires all of us to play our part, and a recognition that those societies that promote religious freedom will prosper and be stable and be good places to be. But those who refuse to take the cause of religious persecution seriously will decay, and deservedly so. Thank you very much for listening.
from an awesome speech. Uh, our next speaker is Mr. Thames, uh, representing the State Department. Uh, Mr. Thames is Special Advisor for Religious Minorities in Near East and South uh, Central Asia, Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. Mr. Thames currently serves as a Special Advisor for Religious Minorities in the Near East uh, Asia at the U.S. Department of State in Washington, D.C. Uh, the first to serve in this capacity, he received civil service appointment in September 2015 and was uh, and led the State Department effort to address situation of religious minorities uh, in these regions. For over a decade and a half, Mr. Thames has worked in various United States government capacities, including two different United States government foreign uh, policy missions, and is an expert on a range of international affairs, including human rights, religious freedom, counter extremism, and international organization, uh, organizations. Uh, before he joined the State Department, he was Director of Policy and Research at the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. Uh, prior to that, he served in the Office of International Religious Freedom at the State Department and was counsel uh, for six years at the United States Commission on Security and Cooperation in Europe, the Helsinki Commission. In addition, uh, Mr. Thames, uh, the United States Army uh, Four College appointed him as an adjunct professor in 2013 through 2016. The State Department appointed him uh, from 2004 to 2012 to the OSCE uh, panel expert of experts on freedom of religion and belief. Mr. James holds a bachelor degree in the US from Georgetown uh, College, uh, a Juris Doctorate from American University in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, College of Law and Masters in International Affairs and American, from American University School of International Service. It was a pleasure to introduce Mr. Thames. Well, it's a great pleasure to be with you again this year. It's my third year in a row to speak at the uh, Coptic Solidarity uh, annual event. Um, it's always great to see Dr. I uh, congratulate you on the great work that Conflict Solidarity is doing and Lindsay's great work as well. Um, and I'm very happy to be on a panel with Assistant Secretary Designate Bob Destro, which was just announced last night by the White House, and he'll, if confirmed, will be the uh, next. <laughs> and of course, it's a great honor to be on a panel with Lord Alton, although it's unfortunate I have to follow him after he speaks. Um, he's such a passionate speaker. Um, Promoting freedom of religion or belief, promoting religious freedom, the rights of religious minorities is a key element of American foreign policy. Religious freedom is a human right that belongs to every individual without exception, and its presence is one of the essential building blocks for permanent peace, security, and stability. This is why we continue to urge all governments to respect religious diversity within their borders and to protect religious freedom, to end discrimination, to decriminalize blasphemy and apostasy laws, and to ensure that each individual has equal rights and equal access to government services, security, and justice. It is why we support the many religious communities and civil society elements working on this issue. It's why we welcome the partnership with Coptic Solidarity. It's why we work to protect the cultural heritage of ancient Christian communities and other groups in the Middle East, because it preserves our common heritage and maintains a connection of communities with their ancestral homeland. And it's why Secretary Pompeo last month announced that the United States will host the first ever ministerial level meeting on promoting religious freedom globally at the end of July. This ministerial will convene government and religious leaders, rights advocates, and civil society from around the world. Its purpose is to identify practical ways that we can all work together to push back against persecution and discrimination based on religion and to promote freedom of conscience, freedom of belief of everybody everywhere. We do this because religious minorities face a critical moment. Attacks by ISIS and other terrorists, as well as repression by authoritarian regimes around the world, threaten the existence of these communities across the Middle East and in many regions of the planet. The United States is fully committed to assisting the victims of ISIS atrocities, promoting religious freedom and protecting religious diversity and pluralism. And we do so, we speak out specifically when groups are targeted. Christians in Egypt are attacked, we speak out for them. 
when Rohingya Muslims from Burma are attacked, we speak out for them, like Hindus in Pakistan. But we can also do it in a way that we approach the right generally. We believe fundamentally that everybody has the right to freedom of belief, belief, and that environments where everyone has this right is an environment where these specific communities will have a, a safe and secure future. Now, my presentation today is going to focus specifically on Egypt and uh, give you a sense of how we see the situation from the State Department. Uh, certainly, Egypt is a country facing many challenges from ISIS and other terrorists, and religious minorities have been repeatedly targeted for attacks, uh, none more so than the Coptic Orthodox Church. And we look at Egypt and we assess the conditions in the context of a counterterrorism effort. And so we're mindful of two things. First, how Egypt battles terrorists, including ISIS affiliates, will really, will really matter and it will impact the long-term success of this effort. In other words, how the Egyptian government goes about this struggle will determine whether it will retain the support of the population it needs to, in order to succeed. And secondly, this ties into the broader human rights situation in Egypt. We see serious problems, including reports of extrajudicial killings, of torture by security forces, and arrests of nonviolent activists. And we're concerned by laws that restrict the activities of NGOs in the country. So, of course, we support Egypt's efforts to confront terrorism, but we believe strongly that to be effective, an indispensable part of those efforts must include protecting free expression, supporting free participation in the political process, and treating citizens equally irrespective of their religious faith. And this also includes protecting space for civil society, which will play a vital role in providing services and ensuring a transparent uh, and accountable government. Now, we understand the threats that, that Egypt faces from terrorists are real and deadly. Between the December 2016 attack at the Coptic Cathedral and the November 2017 massacre at the mosque in the Sinai, Egypt witnessed a bloodletting by terrorists on a horrendous scale. Four geographically dispersed attacks on cops in Cairo, Alexandria, Tanta, and in the Western Desert claimed more than 100 lives. And the Palm Sunday attack alone in 2017 killed at least 36 people and injured more than 100 when the bomb exploded. And in the worst massacre in Egypt's modern history, more than 300 Muslim worshippers were slaughtered in a single incident at their mosque in North Sinai. And the terrorists have killed many of the security and armed forces, we have to remember that, over the same period. Now, regarding government policies impacting religious freedom, we welcome several positive steps that President Sisi and the government has made, but we continue to see areas needing attention. We certainly welcome how President Sisi has attended the Coptic Mass on Christmas for four years in a row. We certainly welcome how he's been outspoken in endorsing equality for all, regardless of their beliefs. And we welcome the progress made regarding uh, the legalization of churches and church construction. Uh, we've seen how the President CC has endorsed the building of a, a new cathedral in New Cairo. And the difficulty that churches have faced in the past obtaining permits for new cons church construction is, is well known, and they've had to frequently made, wait more than a decade to get those permits. Um, so to address the situation, the CC government has ratified the church construction law in 2016, which included a process to legalize unlicensed churches. So we're encouraged by what we hear from the churches that inspectors are working to issue more licenses. Um, and while no new licenses have been issued to build new churches, the government has issued four decrees to allocate land for the sole use of churches in Port Said, Minya, Bayou, and South Sinai. We view these, uh, these decrees as a preliminary step in the process of licensing new church construction. And a report by the Egyptian Initiative for Human Rights indicates that some congregations have also received verbal approvals to build churches. So this is something we're going to continue to watch and encourage the Egyptian government to follow through on. Uh, despite this progress and its indications of progress to come, mobs still attack unlicensed churches whose applications for legalization are pending. In addition, state authorities in several places have yielded to those mobs and ordered the closure of churches. This is occurring despite the fact that the church construction law allows for churches to operate during this interim period while, uh, while the Ministry of Housing reviews their uh, applications. Uh, there's a, a fairly recent case in uh, Beni Mayin in the government of Beni Sway that exemplifies this phenomenon. Uh, media reported that cops had used a building for prayers for over 10 years and that the diocese had submitted that uh, correct paperwork for um, 
regularization of this space as a church. Uh, what happened was, after inspectors visited the church, Muslim villagers pelted it with bricks and stones and started a, a riot. This injured several cops and also resulted in Christian-owned businesses and homes being set on fire. This is uh, an example that we've seen repeated many times in the past. And also repeating the response that we've seen many times in the past, the authorities arrested both the Muslims and the Christians and shuttered the church. Now, eventually, the five Christians that were detained were released, but on the promise from the local church leaders that the church would remain closed as well. Um, we've seen this in other areas. And I think the message that we want to convey is for equality and will of all to be realities. But the message that President Sisi has expressed, individuals who stone houses of worship should be punished, not the victims. And that the church is wrongly closed should be reopened. Now, a matter of accountability another issue where we want to see greater actions taken. In the past, we had these reconciliation committees set up where uh, victims would be forced to reconcile with their abusers, uh, which fostered impunity and further attacks. Um, and we've heard that Coptic religious leaders starting last year has said we're just going to learn to participate in those sessions. Um, so we have consistently encouraged the Egyptian government to uphold the rule of law and take appropriate steps to hold perpetrators accountable. In this regard, we did see the courts hand down 36 convictions imposing the death penalty for the church bombings in Cairo, Alexandria, and Tanta that claimed the life of 70 cops. We've also seen the Egyptian government prosecute and sentence two individuals accused of killing a priest in Cairo and a shopkeeper in Alexandria at separate incidents. Now, regrettably, some of the prosecutions raised separate questions about due process. So while we applaud the Egyptian efforts to hold perpetrators accountable, we want to be sure that it's the actual perpetrators who pay for the crimes and not just some innocent scapegoat who was in the wrong place at the wrong time. After the church bombings, we did see the government call into a state of emergency and provide security to protect churches from terrorist attacks. This was a good thing. However, when some individuals with Muslim identity cards were seen entering these churches, these same security forces allegedly harassed them on the suspicion of being a convert to Christianity. So we recall in 2015, President Sisi saying that everyone should have the freedom to choose what religion or belief to follow. Uh, and this should extend to those who have chosen, chosen excuse me, to change their religion. But we know that many Egyptians that have changed space continue to face severe discrimination, uh, largely resulting from an inability to regularize their status on ID cards. We've also welcomed President Sisi calling for tolerance, and the Ministry of Education has issued new textbooks, which it says remove passages promoting hate and the superiority of one religion over others. However, an issue of long-standing concern is the continuation of Egypt's blasphemy law. One in force, it penalizes those for ex exercising freedom of expression and freedom of religion. In addition, countless others are constrained by fear of imprisonment or fines, and so self-censure, holding back from expressing their thoughts or religious beliefs. And we've seen just as a simple tweet or Facebook posting can lead to someone being charged for blasphemy and being sent to jail. If the United States opposes blasphemy laws, full stop. We've observed that wherever such laws are enforced, they stifle free expression, restrict religious freedom, and lead to human rights abuses and instability. So as I begin to wrap up, you know, we've seen um, some improvements in each and President Sisi has made some strong statements that are certainly positive. But there's a long way to go. One element of, to indicate where is Egypt going, I think, is the level of Coptic representation in government. Um, Cops are still underrepresented in government and public institution. There's only one member of the cabinet who's cop, uh, none of the 27 governors is Christian, and uh, no one, and not a single cop serves as the president of a university. In addition, cops aren't the only, one that, only ones that face such discrimination. We see Baha'is, Jehovah's Witnesses, and Mormons also facing severe limitations. So in closing, we all know that Egypt is a leading country in the Arab world, a country rich in heritage and culture. Yet for Egypt to truly succeed, it needs to harness the talent and creative energies of all its citizens regardless of faith. It needs to ensure Egyptians of minority religious groups do not suffer discrimination in their daily lives. Calls for tolerance and equal treatment for all need to be fully implemented by Egypt's security forces, police, and judiciary.
conversations need to occur that will move Egyptian society towards or forward a greater appreciation for diversity and the rights of all, regardless of their faith. We, so while we welcome these positive steps that have been taken so long, so far, we urge Egypt to redouble its efforts to realize practical equality and freedom of religion for all, to truly foster long-term stability and prosperity for all Egyptians. Egyptian law, Egypt's laws and policies need to provide for freedom of religion and belief for everybody, regardless of what faith they hold or whether they hold any faith at all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kim. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Robert Destro. Uh, Dr. Destro is Professor of Law and Founding Director of the Interdisciplinary Program in Law and Religion at Catholic University of America, uh, Columbus School of Law in Washington, D.C., has been member uh, of the faculty since 1982 and served as uh, interim dean from 1999 to, 19, to 2001. Uh, from, 2000, from 1983 to 1989, uh, Professor Destro served as a commissioner on the United States Commission on Civil Rights and led the commission's discussion in areas of discrimination on the basis of disability, national origin, and religion. Uh, he served as a special advisor to Ohio uh, Attorney General and the Ohio Secretary of State on election law matters from 2004 to 2006 as a general counsel uh, to, uh, to the Catholic as a general counsel to the Catholic League for Religion and Civil Rights uh, from 1977 to 1982 and as an adjunct professor uh, of law at Marquette University from 1978 to 1982. Professor Destro was born and raised in Akron, Ohio. He received his bachelor degree in the arts in 1972 from Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, and his law degree uh, in 1975 from the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, he is co-author with uh, Michael Arians uh, of Religious Liberty and a Pluralistic Society, Carolina, uh, Carolina Academic Press. Uh, Professor Destro kept, uh, lives in Arlington, Virginia, with his wife, Brenda, and two children, Gina and Mark, and uh, I will take opportunity to congratulate you on your new appointment. Well, Dr. Drugas, thank you for, uh, for having me, and uh, thank you for the nice introduction, that, and I suppose 275 will get me a cup of coffee at Starbucks. <laughs> so, the, today what I want to do is talk to you a little bit about what we do about all of this. You know, I approach this from the perspective of a civil rights lawyer. And uh, while it's, uh, it's important to talk about the bad things that happen, one of the things that I learned uh, in my travels around the hill here about three years ago, uh, it was I guess three years ago in August when I was asked by uh, uh, Congressman uh, Jeff Fortenberry and uh, Congresswoman Anna Eshoo to, to draft a genocide resolution for the House. But I thought, well shoot, you know, this is gonna be a piece of cake. You know, and what I realized it was gonna be, it was gonna be, it was a lot tougher than I thought it would be. And during one of the original meetings that we had for breakfast, we had a, uh, a an Assyrian bishop was in, and uh, we had just finished having breakfast, uh, not unlike the lunch you had here. And and in comes a, a big gaggle of congressmen, and and right there, you know, the bishop, you know, was so kind of overwhelmed by having members of Congress greet him and say, well, what do you need us to do? The only thing he could think about is to tell them more horror stories. And, and I finally had to take him aside and I said, Bishop, you know, we know the stories, but a congressman can do one thing, and that's vote. And you need to tell them what you need them to vote for. That's why we're here today. You know, we're talking about how do we get Today is your policy day. And so the question is, what policy do we need to get the 
Coptic community and the other religious communities of the region um, taken care of. Okay, now, what I'm going to do here, because I'm at a Coptic Christian gathering, and I figure I can get away with talking about law and religion in the same sentence without being castigated by certain people. Uh, so I'd like to begin with a reflection of one of the great holy men of the Coptic Church, Abba Anthony the Great. And he said, and I'm going to quote, I said, when the same Abba Anthony thought about the depth of the judgments of God, he asked, Lord, how is it that some die when they're young, while others drag on to extreme old age? Why are there those who are poor and those who are rich? Why do the wicked men prosper and why are the just in need? He heard a voice answering him, Anthony, keep your attention on yourself. These things are according to the judgment of God, and it is not to your advantage to know anything about them. I thought that's a pretty profound statement if you think about it. You know, um, don't worry about others, worry about yourself. Now for those of us, so if we say, well, what are we here for? Why, you know, what's the purpose of this policy day? Well, again, most of us who are cradle Christians would answer the question by referring to the words of Jesus in Matthew 25, 37 through 40, where at the judgment, the righteous, then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when we saw thee and hungered, you know, when did we see, see thee as hungry, and, and when did we feed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When, when did we see a stranger and, and, and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? When did we see the sick or in prison and come unto thee? And the king shall answer them, and he said, Inasmuch as you have done it to the, one of the least of my brethren, you have done it to me. Okay, now, I said, how shall we understand these words? So it says, what are we supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be focusing on the least, right? You know, our obligation is to focus on, on those who need our help. And I would suggest to you, and I'm going to quote now from one of the most influential articles I think I've ever read in, as a civil rights lawyer. Actually, I heard the, uh, the original speech uh, that, on which it is based. It was given by the late Professor Robert Cover of Yale Law School, who, uh, who the, the title of the talk was Obligations, a Jewish Jurisprudence of the Social Order. Okay? And in it, he said, he drew a distinction, and this was a distinction that was very, very well known to Jesus himself. And, uh, and he, he drew a distinction between the Jewish approach to human rights and that of the West. And he said, social movements in the United States organize around rights. When we feel some urgently felt need to change the law or keep it one way or another, a rights movement is started. Civil rights, right to life, welfare rights, refugee rights, the premium that is to be put on an entitlement is so coded. When we take rights seriously, we understand them to be trumps in a legal game. Is this, in Jewish law, an entitlement without an obligation is a sad, almost a pathetic thing. You know, you can hear that discussion going on today in the debate over what's going on at the border. Okay, and the reason I mention this question in terms of what's the legal definition of persecution? Which you'll find if you, get, if you get into the legal literature of what does the word persecution mean? What you're going to find is that it's largely bound up in both refugee law and international human rights law. And what you're going to find also is that there's no definition. As, uh, as one writer put it, he says, uh, persecution is the fundamental concept at the core of refugee definition, yet its meaning remains largely undefined. The courts have been 
basically screaming for the legislatures to write one for quite some time. Because the same thing is true with respect to the definitions of international humanitarian law. There really is no definition. And if you think about it, there's a really good reason why there isn't. We all know, and for those of you who, I mean, just as, as, as Knox and, and Lord Alton were just talking about the horrific things that go on, you know, would we, um, would we kind of, I think all of us instinctively know that any attempt to define the term must be flexible enough, and I'm quoting, to account for the, quote, unfortunate inventiveness of humanity to think up new ways of persecuting fellow citizens. I mean, so if you think about what the definition of persecution is, it runs the gamut from the, the very definition of second-class citizenship that exists in certain societies. Uh, you know, whether or not if you're considered in a, in a majority Muslim society, if you're a dhimmi, you're a second-class citizen. Okay? In, other, you know, in other communities, if you're a foreigner, you're a second-class citizen, or you're certainly not a citizen at all. You know, but in, in that definition, what we find is it runs the gamut from simply mistreatment or failure to treat people equally, you know, which then has consequences in schooling and in opportunities and everything else, all the way to the Coptic martyrs on the beach where they're cutting their heads. You know, and, and for those of us who grew up, you know, looking at religious freedom law from an American perspective, you know, the idea that somebody would actually cut people's heads on the beach was so completely outside the pale that, that you know, you just, it's almost like literally, I hate to use that, this, but your head explodes. So what do we do about it? Right? What do we do about this? And I come back to the conversation that the bishop had with the congressman. You know, okay, enough of the, the stories. What do we do? Okay, well, in order to figure out what we do, we have to think about the nature of the problem that we're facing. Now, believe me, there is persecu there's religious persecution all over the world. Okay, but, you know, we, we make policies without oftentimes by focusing too much on the victims and not enough on the, you know, the the perpetrators. And so what I want to talk about for the next few minutes is the perpetrators and what drives them. And, and more importantly, I think, uh, you know, what we need to be doing here in the United States after the legislative day to get to the bottom of this. Okay, so let me just you go to that one slide here, and um, you know most of the discussion that we have had about the spread of Al Qaeda and ISIS and what they did in Syria and in uh, Iraq and other places. I mean, they bombed Saudi Arabia, they bombed Iran. They, you know, there is, uh, you know, we know what they've been up to. And well, what's the next battleground? This is the next battleground. I mean, we know what's been going on in Egypt, we know what's going on in Libya, you know, but if we look at where are all those people, where are all those bad guys going from, uh, from Syria and from Chechnya and all the others, where are they going? Well, they're going into the Sahel, right? They're going into the Sahel. It's a predominantly Christian area, unlike Syria where there were, there were 40 million people, roughly. There's 550 million people in this region. And if you start asking questions, what exactly is happening that would count as persecution? You just literally go from country to country and you ask people, how many people have died here? I mean, if you just, just focus on the people who died, you know, a hundred people in in uh, in um, uh, what was looking here? Was at, uh, you look at the people in Nigeria. I was thinking in uh, in Ghana. You know, I was just talking with a uh, uh, talking with a, a friend in uh, a priest who was just in northern Ghana, 
and he was talking about the number of people who, uh, who have been killed up there, and as well as the number of people who were trafficked up from, you know, sub-Saharan Africa, up through what they call the Libya Corridor, you know, into Lebanon, the Middle East, they become sex slaves, they become labor slaves, and you say, who's doing this? Right? Who's doing this? And the fact of the matter is, you know, and I'm relying now for my uh, information on my good friend, former governor, uh, South Carolina governor, David Beasley, who now heads the World Food Program. And he says, you know, he's just completely, I, I would have to say, completely concerned about this. And he says, look, he says, everybody talks to the guy who runs the food truck. He says, I even know what kind of cigarettes the, uh, the, the Al-Qaeda leader in Yemen likes to smoke, and I always make sure that I give him a couple extra packs so that I can get more information. And he says, and he's gone to people like President Macron, you know, and he says, guess where all these people are coming when they start to go on the move? Okay, now, he says, they're coming to France. He says, they're coming to France. And my question to you is, why aren't we hearing about this on the news? Right? We hear about the Middle East all the time. Why aren't we hearing about Egypt? You know, is it that, is it that the reporters are hostile? I don't think so. I think like most American Christians, they're simply ignorant. You know, and so the question that I want to leave with you is, look, this is, this is a picture that I, I need you to really remember. And see that arrow, you know, the, uh, the, the, the red arrow right in the middle of it, that's where the U.S. Special Forces people were killed in Mali, right? How many, of, how many of the news reporters ever told you what are they doing there? They didn't. They're fighting Al-Qaeda. You know, they're fighting Al-Qaeda. And so what we need to be doing is focusing on the perpetrators. Right? And, and starting to map out what has happened in these places and to say, how do we go after the bad guys? Okay, now, you in this room cannot do it yourself. If you try and do it yourself, you're going to get into the same position that the good Assyrian bishop was in. You're going to be going all around the capital, you're going to be telling your stories, you know, people will say that's all very interesting. You'll meet with a lower level staff member and it'll get filed and we'll send you a nice letter. Because what you need to be doing is forming coalitions. You know, and you need to be getting out there into the American religious community, particularly the evangelical community. You know, but in every place I have spoken about this genocide, what I learned when people will come up to me afterwards and say, what can I do? I mean, I have a very good friend who's a radiologist at the Cleveland Clinic. He says, where do you want me to go? He says, I, he always spends time in Togo, in northern Togo, which is predominantly a uh, Muslim area. And he came back just recently saying, it's horrible. You talk to the people in, in, the, in the neighborhoods and they'll tell you, yeah, bad stuff is going on. He says, what are we doing? Well, these are the kinds of questions you need to be asking the Congress people you see. And you need to be reaching out across the country to the nearest church in your neighborhood. And you need to get together and you need to show them maps like this and to tell them the story of what's happening. And, and partly you're going to find, as I did, the first time I went to Iraq and then came back and talked to some evangelical friends and they, you know, and they said, well, when, would, when did they meet Jesus? And, so, and the response was, when St. Thomas introduced him to us 2,000 years ago. You know, and the same thing is true when you go and you say, well, what about our Coptic Christians, Christians? Yes, St. Mark was their pastor and St. Matthew. You know, and so the, the question, how do you make coalitions and how, what do you ask of these members of Congress? 
And the answer is, you gotta have a policy that defines who the bad guys are. Because you cannot fight a war unless you know who the enemy is. And the enemy, I might add to you, is not Islam. The enemy are, is a certain, are certain people who hold the view of Islam that, you know, they'll tell me, they'll call you, it's not a, it's not a big deal. You know, but more Muslims have died than the Christians have. And so what we need to, what we really need to understand is what are practical solutions? How do we get your Christian brothers and sisters from your neighborhood over to Egypt to live in the Coptic community, help provide services? You know, to come back, they will be your missionaries. This is my friend who goes to Togo, is the missionary. You know, and he says, could I, could I go to Egypt? I said, I'm sure we can find something for you to do. You know, so the, the and, and as you well know, this question, do you resettle people, do you take them out, what do you do with them, that's all part of this question of persecution. So you have to decide among yourselves, what do you want the congressman or the congresswoman to do? Uh, just, I'll just leave you with that message because the rest of us, whether or not I'm a law professor at Catholic U or should the Senate consent, I become a colleague of, of, of Knox Dames here, you know, we're still going to have to ask and answer the question, what do you want to do? And so I leave you with that question. You know, and I'll tell you, we have to hold these perpetrators accountable and take them out of commission. Thank you very much.